No abnormality. <laughs> Thank God. For a second there, I started to worry that there was something abnormal going on. Hey everyone, hope you're doing well. We're doing something a little different today than what we normally do, a little 1,000 subscriber special. Think of what we're doing tonight as a movie night, a scary movie night. Grab your flashlight, your nightstick, and your loud dangly keyring, because tonight we're picking up an extra shift and doing some night security. The game we're talking about today, Night Security, was developed by independent Japanese studio Chilla's Art, which, according to their Twitter, is a game studio made up of two brothers. They make short, typically hour-long horror games that if you're being a little uncharitable, you could call walking simulators, and if you're being really, really uncharitable, you could call streamer bait. Now, I don't know about you, but for me, I roll my eyes a bit when people disparage a game by calling it a walking simulator, because, let's be honest, there's nothing I love more than a good walk. Also, it's quite ironic people compare games that they find boring or unengaging to going on a walk, the universal thing you do when you're bored and unengaged from staying inside all day and want to explore the outside world. As for calling them streamer bait, I mean, yeah, they are often games with loud, scary noises that will make the little silly man on screen shriek and make a funny face, but you can just as easily become the silly little man on screen in your own life. And take it from me, the Chilla's art games are scary. Terrifying. Like, while I was playing, my neighbors were throwing a super loud, annoying party, but the time I got sucked into the game, I was grateful every time I heard a drunk guy howl in mirth or a baby cry because I was dragged back to the real world and reminded I was sitting in my safe apartment, not going floor by floor in a haunted Japanese office building. And yes, this party had both drunk adults and tons of crying kids, and it went on past midnight. I was confused too, but the point is, this game is scary, but not scary in like a Silent Hill or Soma way. This is not a thinking man's horror. It's just horror what the unparalleled writer of ghost stories mr james would call a pleasing terror that feeling you get when a friend told an especially scary story at a sleepover or when you're jittery driving home in the dark after seeing a horror movie it's not existential or panic inducing it's just plain fun scares i know this sounds pretentious but it's kind of life affirming to me horror like this makes you appreciate going back to your mundane life with a newer sense of appreciation for your boring sense of safety in our humdrum world it's why when somebody asked me my favorite scary movie i'd say something like suspiria or the thing or house Something slightly artsy that distinguishes itself through the artistry of the production, rather than pure scares per minute. But if they asked me what I thought the scariest movie was, I'd say something like The Conjuring or Insidious, a high-budget popcorn movie filled with jump scares and moments of dread, purely calculated to make both the oldest and youngest in the audience moisturize their seats. Okay, let's move on. I, I promised this was going to be a fun movie night, and now I feel like I'm doing the YouTube equivalent of that Nicole Kidman ad AMC plays before the show starts. Anyways, night security. Normally here I talk a bit about the look and gameplay, but there's not a whole lot to talk about. Most of it will bring up as we go along. The game has a cursed VHS filter, which you can turn on or off, but I of course left on. I know we might look back at it in a couple years as pandering to trends, but I love that faux late 90s cursed PS1 analog horror VHS look as much as the next insufferable guy on YouTube. The game doesn't have an inventory or combat mechanics or anything else really to speak of. It is indeed, as I said earlier, what a gamer who hasn't been on a walk in five months would call a walking simulator. It also doesn't really have jump scares, at least in the traditional sense where a loud sting of music plays and something pops out at you. It does have things pop out, but they're mostly unannounced and unaccompanied by sound, which makes the game feel that much more eerie and less predictable. I did play a few other Chillus Arts games before I settled on this, and the other ones did have a fair share of jump scares. Now, this is the most recent game, so maybe they're turning a new leaf or just trying something new with this installment, but I really appreciate that about Night Security. It was also one of the few games they've made that has paranormal horror instead of, um, I don't know what you'd call it, but serial killer, stalker horror? I'm a simple man, and I like my horror games like how I like my women. Supernaturally sexy. Anyways, we start out the game waking up on our couch. It's October the 23rd, and it's pouring outside. There's no intro cinematic or exposition here. You're just a guy, and you piece together what kind of guy you are from what's in the apartment. Some toys and drawings show that you have a daughter. In fact, today seems to have been your daughter's birthday. In one of the bedrooms, you can look in on her sleeping, and in your bedroom, you can just spend some time with something most of my viewers can only dream of attaining for themselves. I'm talking about the view, of course. I mean, come on, how does a security guard in Japan afford an apartment like this? This is like half the size of the apartment that an exaggeratedly poor person would have in an American sitcom, which is really saying something. Anyway, I do really love the vibes of the quiet apartment at night with the rain pouring down as you say goodbye to your family without trying to wake them. It reminds me of times as a kid where we'd have to get up at 3am to drive to the airport because my dad thought we'd miss our flight if we didn't get there three full days early, and it would be pitch black driving past houses filled with people whose days hadn't even started yet. There's something melancholic but also cozy about it. I think in general the early levels in horror games, before things start to get scary, are always really interesting and probably ripe for discussion. We need to get one of those liminal space YouTubers on that ASAP. Anyways, head out the door, next thing you know, we're pulling up to work. I love the empty, rain-soaked city streets as you walk into the building. It has such an interesting vibe to it, like the apartment earlier. Anyways, I promise I'll stop talking about the vibe soon, it's just... Wait a second. Did you see that? Hmm. Hmm. Head into the security office and get your tasks for the night. All we need to do is check the fire alarms, lock the doors, turn off the bathroom lights, and ask people to leave. 
Doesn't sound too bad. Another note tells us that the previous security guard, Keigo Uchigi, suddenly quit, and now they're relying on us. The security office is very cozy, especially with the little radio playing jazz. It reminds you of the safe rooms from the Resident Evil games. That feeling of safety tempered by knowing that outside of the room, everything is very much not safe. Soak up the lo-fi study girl vibe because things won't be cozy again in this game until, well, they just won't. When we check the security cameras, it tells us that some people are still here, which is just the right amount of ominous. Well, anyways, we have our task for the night. Let's get started. The first floor is pretty chill. You just have to poke around in a dark office and finish your little jobs. You do run into an NPC who seems to be some sort of upper management and refers to us as the new security guard. He's pretty normal though, besides the oblivion NPC stare and the shadowy ethereal aura surrounding him, which I'm sure was a visual glitch, but wouldn't go away no matter what options I checked or unchecked. Anyways, turn off the bathroom lights and floor one is done. Ah, so that's what the girl's bathroom looks like. I love the sound design here. The pouring rain outside paired with the mundane office sounds like the deep hum of the vending machines and various door shutting noises echoing through the building, which are normal and expected in an office, but just creepy enough to give you some pause as you make your way up the elevators to the second floor. Get ready, because there are 11 floors in total. And before you start theory crafting, no, there are only nine circles of hell in Dante's Inferno, not 11. I looked it up when I wondered if I could milk that for this video. The second floor isn't much worse. There is an incredibly normal and not dead-eyed looking woman who flirts with you and makes you give her your number. She's also somehow able to insert heart shapes into her speech, which is pretty impressive. I don't know, this didn't faze me too much. I just reminded myself it was only a video game and I didn't actually have to talk to a woman who expressed romantic interest in real life. Ah, uh, hate to see her leave, but love to watch her go. Am I right, fellas? Also, in the woman's bathroom, you startle a woman in the stalls when you try to turn off the lights. She recognizes you as the security guard, which is surprising considering it's her first night, and tells you she'll turn them off when she's done. One less thing to do, another small victory and the second floor is done. On the third floor we find another TV. This one plays a tape of a man working and seemingly getting braided by his boss. When you check the bathroom, you catch a glimpse of a lady heading down the stairs, which there wasn't anyone on the floor earlier, so I'm not a huge fan of that. When you turn off the lights in the woman's bathroom, the person in the stall yells at you for turning the lights off when they ask you not to. Oh, sorry, forgot about that. But wait a second, weren't you on the previous floor? Anyways, now let's press on to the fourth floor. The printer's on the fritz and shooting out paper, but hey, that wasn't on the list. Not our problem. There's a guy on the floor who's still working because his boss has been hounding him. He says we're the only ones who knows how hard he works, and every time he sees us, he gets relieved because he gets to go home, which is a bit puzzling again, given that we've been told that this is our first day at the building. Hmm. Anyways, he leaves, so now we can go check the bathroom and... Okay, uh, okay, that's fine. Let's just replace the lights and be on our way. Oh, the printer's done, and there's this printed image of a woman in a vest. Time for floor five. The fifth floor is no power at the moment. You can't even get the normal, no abnormality reading on the fire detectors. You head into what looks like a supply closet to turn it back on, but what's the floor covered in? Is that just a red carpet? Is that blood? I think it might be blood, boys. The closet ends up being way longer than expected. Like, where is this thing physically existing in space right now? Is this a House of Leaves situation? Anyways, at the end of it, you're able to grab the fuse and turn on the power and head back to finish your jobs. Uh, wait a second, wait a second, I need to check something. Okay, let's see. Sensitivity is on two, that looks good. Crosshair is enabled. Let's see, V-Sync every V-Blank. Yeah, no clue what that means, but that sounds good. VHS filter on. Okay, everything looks good. Let's, uh, let's unpause. Once you make your way back and replace the fuse, when you turn around, this nice lady is here. Here's footage from my original blind playthrough to show how utterly unfazed I was by her. She recognizes you and tells you to turn the lights back on before telling you she's leaving and wishing you good luck with your job. This parting words sound slightly familiar, and she looks a bit familiar too. Huh. Anyways, turn on the switches to get power back and watch another VHS clip, where two coworkers talk about another female coworker who seems to be so ingratiating that she's being taken advantage of. Later, in the small security room on the fifth floor, you find a mysterious note from your predecessor, giving his reason for quitting something to do with a certain moment with a woman that was caught on tape. You can also watch the live security footage from the sixth floor where two women are talking, one of whose uncanny ability to add heart emojis into her speech makes you realize that she is the same woman who got your number earlier, but who you saw leave the building. She's talking about how she stole her boyfriend, a security guard, from another female coworker. A moment later, the lights switch off and some unseen presence begins to chase them. <laughs> sorry, sorry. It's, it, it, it's not funny, is it? The heart emoji girl gets away at first, but it's ultimately quartered in the emergency exit. We hear an unpleasant squelching noise and then see the door covered in blood. This whole sequence is maybe not the best executed, but it's cool in theory. It reminds me of an animation here on YouTube called Pursuit by David Romero. Things are getting very spooky, but we have a job to finish, and still five floors left. The sixth floor is covered in blood and gore, likely the results of the scene we just witnessed. 
There is a very, very large cleaning lady who is staring at the carnage on the floor the same way I do when I walk into her room and forget why I came in there. There's some jazz playing though, so that's nice. Inside what looks like a break room or lounge, there are these mountains of chairs cast in disarray on the floor, making much of the room blocked off. When you lock the door, the cleaning lady takes a, a very strong interest in you. Time to lay on some of that usual offish charm, and you should be able to get away scot-free. So, um, do you, uh, do you have any, uh, hol uh, hol do you, I mean, uh, weekend, uh, any fun, any, any fun weekend plans you're doing this weekend? The, this weekend? Whoa, nailed it. By the seventh floor, things are starting to look a bit different. Dilapidated, disused, perhaps even hellish. The situation isn't helped by the fact that this floor is scattered with eerie mannequins straight out of a Goosebumps cover. I love this particular one in the door, perfectly set up to send a shock through you when you're around the corner. The elevator buttons on this floor are missing, so you have to find them by climbing these ladders to leave and advance to the next floor. But besides even the mannequin, it doesn't seem like you're alone. You put the buttons back in the slots and call the elevator, but the dummies don't seem to want to let you go. The 8th floor is honestly comparatively chill, though there's some gnarly water damage they should probably check out. There's also this nice little scare right when you got off the elevator. I actually love this aspect of the game's design, where the doors of the elevator closing and opening are the first and last thing you see on a new floor. You just have to sit and watch as a world of new horrors opens or closes before you. When we go to turn off the lights in the woman's bathroom, we have another encounter with our friend in the stall. She's crying and speaking cryptically about how it's not her fault that she couldn't do anything, that it's not her fault that they died, for the lights suddenly shut off. This moment was initially horrifying, but funnily enough, I couldn't figure out how to leave or turn the lights back on, so by the end it was just sort of frustrating, to be honest. Anyway, some giant bloody handprints smack onto the bathroom door. Time for the ninth floor. The ninth floor starts off very strong. In fact, so strong I had to pause right after the moment I showed you and be done playing for the night. On this floor, we get an even stronger sense of the mysterious degradation of the building. It's almost unrecognizable from the banal but commonplace and familiar look of the first floor. Needless to say, something is rotten in the state of Denmark. Also on the ninth floor is a guy sleeping on company time. When you wake him up, he asks you why you keep coming over and over, and why every time he wakes up, you're standing there. When you lock up and are ready to leave, you find the buttons on the elevator don't work. Guess we have to try the emergency exit. We head through the same kind of tunnels we saw on floor 5, and are eventually able to get the emergency exit key. Something is blocking our way though. Finally, we get out of the tunnels and head through the emergency exit, which has been blocked to us through the whole game, but which we've seen the other office workers leaving through. Anyways, the 10th floor is really not looking too hot. It's got that Silent Hill rusted and neglected look to it, and in the main conference room, all the chairs and desks are inverted. Anyways, do your job and check the fire alarms and turn off the bathroom lights. We're almost done. Only one more floor. I love the contrast here between the well-lit, well-maintained elevator and the grimy corridor that looks like Pyramid Head is going to come lumbering after us any second. Anyways, final floor time, and as you can maybe expect, the elevator rebels, sending us down hurtling through the depths, down the 11th floors we've traversed, below the street, perhaps into the center of the earth, or maybe just the decaying heart of the building. When the elevator doors open, the walls are twitching with bloody, writhing characters, and we see a computer screen on some kind of gory altar. That's her. The woman from the 5th floor. The woman on the printer pages. She retreats into the darkness, inviting us to follow her. No, not inviting. Demanding. We have no choice now. The familiar office layout is now dripping with blood. And if you think that's bad, Picari sweat is 10 yen more expensive down here. In one of the rooms, a computer monitor awaits you surrounded by other monitors, like a congregation of dead-eyed worshippers around a high priest. Plug in the TV, retrieve the videotape, and see what awaits. The tape shows long shots of grainy footage from around the office, with no humans in frame and ominous noises in the background. Then we see her again. Her. I love you, she begins to say. I st And then static. Darkness. Discord. The curse of the building will not allow a word as innocent and warm as love to be so much as uttered. It's time to go. It's coming for you. God, does this ghost terrify me. We've seen glimpses of it before, but seeing it actually move is another level. The way you can barely look at it. The way it bends its head and stares at you when it walks. Even the AI is scary. You try to kite it around the table, but if you're too fast, it'll catch on and start walking the other way. Usually I don't find monsters in games to be very scary after you get the first couple looks at it, but this was not true at all in this case. 
If you try to escape, the monster catches you, bringing up the credits and showing what seems to be the bad ending. The footage of the game reverses and reveals that all along, you were Keigo Ochigi, the previous security guard, trapped in some sort of hellish cycle of guilt where your nightmarish experiences in the office building are relived over and over. As for the good ending, there are buttons to input a code. If you enter the date of today, also the date of your daughter's birthday, the elevator opens. I didn't notice this when I was playing because I was running on pure adrenaline to stay away from the ghost, but I like how there's a bunch of crossed out combinations on the wall, like you've been repeating this ordeal over and over with no success. Anyways, get on the elevator and escape the ghost. You awake in a hospital bed. It's pouring outside. And good news, your wife and daughter are here to visit you. Someone else is too. So what happened? I don't know man, it's pretty vague. I have a bit of mixed feelings about this. I personally love vague stories and unresolved endings because you effectively have the tools to puzzle out what happened to yourself, which makes the story that much more memorable for me. At the same time, I feel like some of the clues we were left behind were a bit too vague, and maybe even some things were lost in translation. Anyways, my stab at the story of Night Security is this. You are trapped in a cycle of guilt and horror, the one that is certainly actually penetrated by a supernatural presence. You were a married security guard who fooled around and began an affair with a demure and put-upon woman at the office, a woman who was taken advantage of by her co-workers and iron-fisted boss. This is pretty true to the actual issues in the Japanese working environment as I understand them, where long hours and utter loyalty are expected, those in authority can essentially do whatever they want, and women especially are the ones who get trod upon in the workplace. Anyways, eventually you are seduced away from her by Heart Emoji Girl. At this point, the red vest woman does something drastic that ends in her death. Does she unalive herself? Does she kill her love rival and then unalive herself? Or does she do something drastic like burn down the office with your coworkers inside? The last doesn't have a ton of proof, but it would make sense why there are other workers seemingly trapped in the same unearthly cycle as you. It also explains what the voice in the stall, presumably the more docile and regretful part of the red vest woman's ghost, says about other people dying and disappearing. That said, there's a lot unanswered. What was the moment caught on camera that Keigo complains about in the note? What's with the mannequins and the cleaning lady? Does the ending mean that you've escaped the cycle, but the spirit is still pursuing you, or did you never leave? After all, your wife and daughter were there at the beginning. Have you been in a coma the whole time, or are you actually dead? Like I said, I love the vagueness and mystery of the game's story that allows us to fill in the gaps and draw our own conclusions, but there is such a thing as being a little bit too vague. Either way, Night Security was a truly terrifying and fun experience, and I'll probably be thinking about it for some time to come. And I'm excited to plumb the depths of Chilla's Arts catalog on other dark and lonely nights. Thank you so much for staying this long. This is a bit different from content I've made in the past, so please do let me know if you liked it, and as always, let me know if you have any games you want to see me cover. And again, thanks so much for 1k. It's kind of hard to wrap my head around that a thousand of you like my stuff enough to want to stay tuned and watch me grow. I started making these as a pure creative outlet, so knowing that other people have been able to find them, let alone appreciate them, is incredibly rewarding. Anyways, that's all for tonight. Thank you so much for your time, dear viewer. I wish you all the good fortune in the world. I remain your faithful snuggler.